Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. <clears throat> Thank you very much for the anthem you chose for me today, Alec. I think it's something that resonates with everyone in this audience. So um, I think that was a very good choice. However, if you knew me better, you would have chosen my preferred music, which is completely something different, and that would be Russian rock music. You didn't know that. If you look at my email address, you'll find it there. It is Zemfira. Zemfira is a Russian rock singer. Uh, but I'm very happy with the Boko as well. Let me start off by saying thank you very much for the opportunity to be here this afternoon. Um, it's a wonderful occasion. It's a wonderful opportunity to speak to one another. And I think that is exactly what we should be doing. We should be speaking to one another more often and look at what's going on at the moment. My apology that I couldn't be here yesterday. I would have loved to listen to my colleagues from the different parties in the multi-party char charter to hear what they've had to say. I had a different fight, unfortunately, yesterday to be in Parliament uh, to try and prevent the ANC from stealing some more money because yesterday they changed the act that deals with the funding of political parties to favor the ANC. Um, we will take that to court. We will challenge that because I've got no doubt in my mind that it's unconstitutional. You can go and have a look at Section 236 in the Constitution that deals with this. But the interesting thing was it's a clear sign of the desperation of a party that knows they are losing power. That's what it's about. And they are so desperate that 76 days before the election, they tried to change the formula to benefit the ANC. The opposition is united and civil society is with us and we will challenge that. And I warned the minister that it's uh, very unfortunate because they bring the election to a certain extent in jeopardy if we need to have a problem with the election date. But be that as it may, let me give you a perspective from my view of how things are. And unfortunately, Alec, I have to uh, just correct one thing. It's worse. I didn't get to Parliament in 1994. I got there in 1988. That's even six years more. So at the end of this month, on the 29th of March, I will have been in Parliament for 36 years non-stop. And that 36 years, I've been in opposition each and every day. And it's difficult to be in opposition, but it's a huge challenge if you can succeed in getting things done with being without power. Just to put that in perspective, when I got there, there was a gentleman in charge of this country called uh, Mr. P.W. Boerta. Some of you may remember him. I saw Mr. Boerta go, and then Mr. Detlat, and then the transition in 94, Mr. Mandela, Mr. Mbeki, Mr. Ruplantle, then Mr. Zuma, um, and after that, Mr. Ramaphosa. I got there and I saw the ANC get into power and I intend to stay there to see the ANC get out of power. And luckily, I don't have to stay very long. My view is that we can do something about that very soon, but hopefully in 76 days from now. But let me start off by just giving one other perspective, perhaps from where, how we got to where we are. <clears throat> Prior to 1994, we had a huge conflict and a struggle in South Africa between two very strong powers, if I put it that way. On the one hand, the ANC, known as the Liberation Movement, and all the forces in that regard. On the other hand, the ruling party, the government of the day. There was a huge conflict. And it came to the point where everyone realized you can't go on like this, and it started the whole negotiation process. I was there, and it led to the formation at Kudesa, and a new constitutional dispensation was negotiated, and that became the current constitution. Sometimes people talk about the final constitution. There's no such thing as a final constitution. It's the current constitution because constitutions can change. But the point I would like to make is that that agreement that developed into where we are now in terms of the constitution was an agreement between what I call the first generation leaders at the time who knew the conflict at the time. Mr. Mandela, Mr. de Klerk, party that I belong to, General Fulhume, um, in Carter, a Freedom Party, Chief Putelezi was there, Abantu Olamisa and some of the others. That was the first generation leaders. They knew the conflict where we came from. They signed an agreement. But then 10 years went by and suddenly we found second generation leaders. The first generation leaders retired. 
The second generation leaders were people like Mr. Mbeki, part that I belonged to. My brother was a leader at the time. Kutelezi was still there. Zak de Beer from the Democratic Party was gone. It was Tony Leon. Those second generation leaders were part of the process at Kudesa and they still remained committed to the settlement. And then another 10 years went by. And now we start to get to third generation leaders like Mr. Malema and others who now start to say, we were not there. We were sold out in that settlement that was agreed at the time. And then things start to fall apart. In other words, what I'm saying is the middle ground that was founded in 1994 in the settlement is starting to get eroded from both sides. If we allow that to happen, the middle ground may fall apart and we may end up again completely opposed in different confrontational segments. Now we're going into the 2024 election and I've heard and I listened to the analysts this morning it's most likely going to be the most interesting and most fascinating election since 1994, I've got no doubt, because we've got so many role players and we've got all the opinion polls. Now, I've seen in my long career that I don't take the opinion polls all that serious. You have to take note, you have to listen to what they are saying. But at the end, end the evening at the results center, when the votes come in and you look at the results board, that's what really counts. Sometimes polls are there to influence the electorate. That, With all due respect, let me give you one example. The latest poll about from the Bentist Foundation, I'm very skeptical. Let me say why. In terms of their poll, 14 months ago, allegedly, the ANC in this province only had 13% support. According to the poll yesterday, 14 months later, they're supposedly now at 35%. It's not true. We don't see that on the ground. We don't experience that. I have my view why that is being done, but let's leave it at that. So, I have dedicated my time in politics from a position point of view to, within a constitutional manner, to have regime change and get the ANC out. And it was mentioned today that the ANC did some good things when they started off. I was there, I saw that. In 94, when we got there, the ANC came there with their A team. It was the best they had. People who were in exile, people who was in prison, but it was the A team. After five years, the A team left. Some retired, some went into business, and they sent us the B team. And so it continued. I'm telling you, we now have to deal with the F team in Parliament. And if we have the F team in Parliament, what do you think is happening in the provinces? And what is happening on local government level in terms of representation? It's very difficult. So as we go into the election, you'll find that there are more than 300 political parties registered in South Africa, but I've got good news. 95% of them was not going to participate in the election because 95% of them consists of me, my wife, the dog, and a fax machine. And I'm very happy to be called Mr. Leader at night, but they do not participate. They are not serious contenders. You can forget about them. Then I would say there's approximately 10 to 15 political parties, which we would like to call the A-team. Those are parties that do have the capacity to participate on national level, as well as in all nine provinces. In order to get your name of your party on those 10 ballots for the different elections, you need to pay a deposit that's 750,000 rand, then you are on the ballot, then the campaigning starts. So I would say there are 10 to 15 parties that fall into that category. The polls indicate, and we all know that the ANC is in serious trouble. We don't know how serious, but we will see where that plays out. A lot is being said about MK. Let's see how it plays out. But most likely, and I may be wrong, MK will do very well, I guess, in KZN, especially in the north. They should do okay in Mpumalanga, and they should do very well, or perhaps okay, in Gauteng, around the mining hostels. Because the appeal would be an ethnic Zulu appeal, just naturally happening because of the appeal and the whole process there surrounding Mr. Zuma, and never underestimate him. I will say never ever underestimate the ANC. The ANC is not voluntarily going to let go of power. Don't make a mistake. We saw that in practice after the 2021 elections in most other metros, and I was involved in the middle of those negotiations to form coalition governments. The ANC did almost everything legally and almost illegally to destabilize those coalition governments and to topple them. They will do the same after this election. I have no doubt about that. 
I do not believe that the ANC is this wonderful democratic organization committed to democracy. It's one thing to say you're a Democrat. It's something else to say I've lost power. Here are the keys to the union buildings. Let's see how that plays out. The win started after and flowing from the coalition agree agreements and negotiations during the no local government elections. A very strong feeling started to emerge that we can do something with coalitions. And let me just say this. We have had an abnormal democracy for the last 30 years in South Africa. Why do I say that? Our electoral system is a straight proportional representation system. People vote for a party, votes are counted, percentages are calculated, and then that will determine your seats in Farnham. Look across the world. In normal systems like this, you almost never will find that one party will end up with a majority of the vote. It's not the case. You'll find in Germany that some party will end, end up with 35% and people will say, we won the election, and then they form a coalition. 21 laid the ground for the start of this process. 24 will take it further, and we will go into coalition governments. Now, the question is, how do you do that? How do you form these coalitions? Sometimes people think coalitions are there just to negotiate positions. I can give you a guarantee those coalitions will fail. They will get nowhere. There's a huge theory behind how you're supposed to do this. You go into a coalition, and the parties that want to form a coalition at least would have certain things in common. They negotiate from their manifestos a compromise, and that compromise forms a new agreed coalition manifesto. And that coalition government then tries to govern for the next five years in terms of the compromise agreed manifesto. That's what it's supposed to be. So I think it was in April of last year, the Democratic Alliance had their federal conference and uh, John Stenhausen there announced the Moonshot Pact. I thought it was a mistake. Why? Because there was no consultation with any other part, none whatsoever. I understand why they did that. That was an attempt for the Democratic Alliance to regain the initiative. But where we stand today, the moon is dead, the shot is dead, and the pack as well. Because we replaced that with a multi-party charter for South Africa, consisting of 18 players mainly to form a process. And let's be clear about that. The multi-party charter is not a coalition. It's a pre-election agreement between some serious role players. And that multi-party agreement basically does have a united vision. He does have identified certain priorities. He does have in common certain principles. And interesting, if we talk about a government of national unity, could become complicated because there's a clause in the agreement, I think it's clause 7, that says the parties that signed the multi-party chartered agreement undertake to each other that none of us will vote for any candidate being put up by the ANC after the election. So, where are we going with that? But we'll get to that situation. So now we have a multi-party charter. <clears throat> and let me be frank. Any political party that comes to you and say, only us, or we are the strongest, or we can defeat the ANC, don't believe that. It's not true. It's not going to happen. No single party is going to defeat the ANC at the polls. It's not going to happen. What can happen is a coalition of parties that work together and combine and form a government afterwards. And that's what we need to do. That's the way out and that's the way forward. And I say sometimes, I believe the multi-party charter could be a coalition of the good people in South Africa. Because we've got certain things in common, certain values in common, certain visions in common, etc., etc. Let me just refer to one thing that uh, Alec referred to uh, during my career, and I've got five minutes left, and we won't get to everything, but I think in question time we'll deal with other things as well. When this party that I belong to, the Freedom Front Plus, was formed just in the run-up to the 1994 election, the party was formed on the 4th of March. It was just after what happened in Babutatswana. I don't know how many of you remember that. Um, we had to combine and marry two very different cultures in one political party. We were young politicians, members of parliament then, who said we need to form a vehicle to continue with what we want to achieve. And we got married basically to a military group. Some military people, was General Foyun, former head of the Defence Force, some other military guys, and we had to marry those two cultures. It was rather difficult because the general thought we are troops and he's a general. But let me give you an example. 
after the 94 election, we got to Parliament after the first, for the first sitting of Parliament, and we're in our caucus room, and we are discussing the business of the day. The general is the leader, so when we start, we open the proceedings, and then the general says, well, gentlemen, I, I suggest we adjourn, and we go outside. When he came in this morning, he saw that the precincts of Parliament are very dirty, and he suggests we go out and clean the precincts of Parliament. From the general's perspective, this is a military base. The base is not clean or tidy, and he is now instructing the troops to go out and clean the base. So we see, General, two things. First of all, Parliament does employ people that keeps the premises clean. And secondly, you have to understand that around this table, this place is a huge equalizer. We are all equal members of Parliament. No generals, no troops, just members of Parliament. So throughout the process, we started and we had to marry that culture, and there are many things that happened in that regard. I will refer to the whole question of, um, from Freedom Front Plus's point of view. The Freedom Front Plus is a unique party. We've been in Parliament since 1994 from the first election. We've had representation throughout. Um, there are only three parties in South Africa that I would describe as real national parties at this stage, meaning they are represented on the National Forum, in the National Parliament, and in all nine legislatures. Only three, ANC, the DA, and the EFF. Then the next party in that regard is the Freedom Front Plus, because we are represented on National Parliament and in eight other provinces. And then you go down. Some of the parties are much more regional, for example, the IFP, National Support, and in KZN. And you can go down. So, as a party, we've said right from the beginning that our Emphasis is, and I honestly believe, and that's almost a different discussion, we believe that the recipe for nation building that the ANC has tried in South Africa for 30 years has failed. And it will continue to fail because it's the wrong recipe. And it's quite ironic <clears throat> that the, the, my, the anthem that you chose for me illustrates that point. What is the recipe currently in South Africa for nation building? We try to unite from one sporting event to the next. And then we all feel very proud and very pro-South Africa. It started with the 95 Rugby World Cup when Mr. Mandela wore the number six jersey. And we all felt very proud for our lot. And then it was the Cricket World Cup. But South Africa got kicked out, I think, in the quarterfinals. It didn't last very long. But then the 2010 Soccer World Cup, we were all wonderful. Even the thieves stopped stealing for about three months. But then again, we fall back into different perspectives and different views of South Africa. And it goes on and on and on party that I belong to say, realize the diversity of this country, not as a negative, but as a very positive feature. Once an American journalist asked me, tell me how many people in this country speak the language of Africa? I said, none. That's why we've got 11 official languages, and the 12th is now as well sign language. We say, recognize the diversity, identify the different communities, and use that as strong building blocks to build a stable democratic system that can last. Why? People want to feel that they are being listened to within their own communities, and that there's a lot of things that go with this. It's a bottom-up approach. It's not a top-down approach. Where everything is centralized in the central government, and Pretoria will decide what you teach your children in the Western Cape. It's the opposite. Subsidiarity. Decisions should be taken at the lowest level in communities, and only those things that you cannot do on your own should be evolved upwards to province or to nation. For, uh, Alec correctly pointed out the whole concept of uh, Cape independence, and I guess that will come to wraps uh, during the discussion, etc., etc. In this election, I've been a, uh, I'm the leader of the party in the Western Cape. I've also been appointed by the party as the premier candidate in the Western Cape. So I guess me and Mr. Alan Windy will meet from time to time. Now, let me be blunt, and I've got nothing to hide. During the 2021 elections, I said to the Democratic Alliance, I'm going out there to force you into coalitions in various local governments. We succeeded in that. I think there are 11 councils where we co-govern with the Democratic Alliance in this province. You won't hear about that. You won't read that in the press because it's successful governments. And I'm a very fond supporter of coalition government. Why? I believe no single party does have all the answers alone. Coalitions force you to compromise, to get to listen to others and come with the best kind of government, and it also helps in terms of transparency and keeping people account. 
So I've heard what Gaten has said this morning. I was the back of the hall and I listened to Gaten. I can tell you a lot about that evening that he referred to at my home. It was a fascinating evening. <laughs> it was really fascinating, but it was fun. I enjoyed all of that. And I hear what Gaten is saying about the Western Cape. I am convinced that after this election, we will have coalition governments in Gauteng. We will most likely have coalition government in KZN. And don't be surprised if we also have one in the Western Cape. Get about the polls. Let's see where we go. Part of my intention is to take the Democratic Alliance in this province into a coalition. Not to oppose, not to be difficult, but to make sure that we've got better government in the Western Cape. And I can assure you that if there are other parties or other forces who want to take charge of the Western Cape to the detriment of all of us, the Freedom Front Plus will come to the rescue, if need be, of the Democratic Alliance and form a strong coalition, as we've shown throughout the process, as a reliable, dependable coalition partner. Alec referred to, this, uh, to the phrase that says, uh, adult in the room, I really appreciate that. Um, sometimes some of the other parties in the coalition don't feel very comfortable when we say that. We didn't choose to say that. That is an, a tag that has been given to myself and the Freedom Front Plus. Why? Because of the role that we play in the best interest, not only of the voters, but South Africa in general. And we will continue to play that role. We will continue to do so. No part, and it's very difficult. I can assure you, I can give you all the details of that negotiation process when we put together those coalitions in the, some of the metros, etc., was very challenging. But you need to do that. And um, let me st stop this section by referring to one example, a practical family example. I was brought up in a political home. There's a long family history of politics. My father was in politics. He was a minister for 10 years. My grandfather was a member of parliament and my great-grandfather too. My brother was with me in parliament for 30 years. And we sat next to one another in parliament, not because we are brothers, but because we were elected into by-elections three weeks apart in 1988. So there's a long history. So when I grew up and I was at school, we were three boys, basically. My father was then at the height of his career, and he was awake from home quite often. And then he would come home and he would ask my mother, did the boys behave? What did they do? Now, we were three teenage boys, and like teenagers do, we were fighting and pushing and whatever the case may be. And then my father would have a court case. A very unjust and unfair case. Why? He would ask only one question. Not what happened. Not who provoked who. He'll ask one question. Who of your, you three lost your temper first? That's the only question. Now that was not being very fair. I think that's why I studied law. He asked that question to program us. In this game, you can never lose your temper. And I can show you many examples of colleagues who destroyed their careers when they lost their temper. Now, when you get to coalitions, when you get to negotiations, you need some people there who can just slog it out and do everything that you need to do. I didn't get to the results, but, but we can expect for the election. Um, it's going to be the most unpredictable election since 1994, there's no doubt. But it's wonderful to be part of that, and perhaps I can see the ANC go. Thank you.